things as being self-existent and existing completely independent of us. And as we saw in that suffering and its causes chart, um, that leads to attachment to pleasant things, aversion to unpleasant things in a big mess. Now, one of the difficult things with this practice is what's called the two extremes. Now we are stuck in this extreme of existence, meaning we are stuck in the extreme of grasping onto things existing independent. Independent me, independent world. And in this Vipassana meditation, when we start to come to investigate this independent me that seems to be here and the independent world that seems to be there, and we investigate and we don't seem to be able to find this independent me, independent world, then one of the most common things is then people simply flip to the other extreme of non-existence or nihilism. Because for us now, there's only two possibilities. Either there is this real independent me and real independent world, or there's no me and no world. Because the only me and world we've really experienced is this supposed independent me, independent world. And if we start to undermine that in the Vipassana meditation and don't find this independent me, independent world, then that not finding, which is an experience of emptiness, people often misinterpret the, what that means. People often in, misinterpret the experience of not finding as there's no me, there's no world. And then they fall to the extreme of nihilism, and often with that comes a lot of fear. Because particularly what we're going to be doing now this morning is focusing on me, the person. Is there really an independent me here? And we're going to be looking for this independent me. And if we don't seem to be able to find it, then often people have this experience, this not finding seems like I'm going out of existence. And then people develop a lot of fear. So again, this fear is completely irrational. The only thing that's going out of existence is a false sense of me that we've been holding on to our entire life. So... Therefore, to help overcome this extreme of nihilism is to reflect on dependent arising. That the fact that things do exist depending on cause and conditions, parts, labelling and conception. And so that can help us to overcome this extreme. So by reflecting on both of these elements, we can find the middle way between those two extremes. So that's what we're going to uh, try to do today. Um, before we uh, begin meditation, um, just one more thing. As we look out on the world and we you know, draw these lines and give names, that's fine. We need to do that to function. But again, what we do is we turn these lines into boundaries and we see the world as already divided up into many separate discrete things. In most of our experiences, the very first line we draw is we draw a line around here and create the experiencer. Because there's single experience. And in single experience, there are two aspects. Of course, there's experiencer and experienced. And we need to conceptually uh, distinguish these two aspects. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't function. We couldn't even have a sense of me. And I think a newborn baby even struggles to do this. So we need to draw a line to create the me, give it, give it a name so we can communicate. So there's no problem there. But again, the problem is we don't realise that's what we're doing. We believe we turn this line into a boundary. We grasp onto and believe there is an independent me here to begin with. But this is... So we're turning the line into boundaries. So this is what's called self-grasping. So self-grasping self -grasping here is grasping onto an independent me. So this self here is independent me, independent self. Now... And so we then we, we, we draw a boundary, we turn the line into a boundary, 
and we contract around the me part of the experience and we grasp onto the me part of the experience and believe there's an independent me here to begin with. But this is completely illogical. And to highlight that, we can ask the question, is this big? Is it big? Depends. So we can't have big on its own. Illogical, irrational, yeah? So you can, you can only have big relative to small. You can't have big and small. I mean, it makes no sense, doesn't it? Likewise, you can only have up with down, in with out. Likewise, you can only have me with not me. The not me can be you, the world, doesn't matter. You can't have me without not me. It makes no sense. But that's what we do. We... So you can only have experiencer with experienced. You can only have subject with object. What we do is we grasp onto the me and believe there's an independent me here to begin with. That grasping on to the belief there's an independent me is exactly like saying this is big. It just makes no sense whatsoever. No sense whatsoever. So therefore, uh, this self-grasping is completely out of sync with reality. Because there's no such thing as an independent me, just like there's no such thing as independent big. Question. Still, my, uh, my ability is, is only to this area of stuff happening. <laughs> but the sense of identity can be very small or very big. Can't it? Yeah. So it's not always the skin surface, is it? But it's not uh, you. I mean, I, I feel here. I can't sense if, if, there is, if there is a scratching here. Yes, but... There is no reality to the line. Like this line how, is not what is, how come that my mind is... Yeah, but I mean, we can, say, we can say also there's, a, there's a, uh, the edge of the pen, but that doesn't mean the pen exists independ independently, does it? Right. So, what's um, what's your question? If I'm 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 saying like, um, uh, how come the, the the mind is connected to the like like what what makes it stick together? Still, still. together. <laughs> what's what's still the together? Mind, uh, the the body. Body. Oh, because the the body is the support for the mind. Is that the question? Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. 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 But also within Buddhism, we can talk about deeper levels of the mind that are not connected with the body. Not associated with this, this body. So the, the coarse level of mind that is active now is associated with this body. This, is, this body is the, the support for that coarse level of mind. But... There are deeper levels of mind that are not associated with this body. Deeper levels of our mind. Like what? We're coming to that. Okay. Is, did you have anything more in that? Um, there is always more to that, but uh, I got some, something. Yeah, so, <laughs> but also, also, you know, the, the sense of me can in, include this or it can exclude this. No? Yeah. When we say my body, then where's the sense of me? It's excluding the body, isn't it? When you say my body, mm -hmm. then there's a me with a body. So that sense of body is excluded from me. 
No. So what I'm saying is suggesting is that the person, and that's we're jumping ahead now. Actually, we're what's coming up, but the person, like everything, is labelled on the basis of the body and the mind, but not the whole body and the whole mind all the time. I mean, you can have me on the basis of some small part of the mind as me, or some small part. You know, like if we've hurt our ankle, we say, I am hurt. So then we're identifying me on the basis of the ankle, aren't we? Or, you know, I am angry, then we're solely basing the sense of me on, on something going on in the mind as me, aren't we? Then the body's not part of me then. Technically, the mind has no location because it's not physical. So the mind is not here. The mind is not in the body. Technically, you can't say that. You can say it's associated with the body. It's, it's nowhere because it's not matter. No, the, the coarse mind is, is associated with this body, but that doesn't mean it's in the body because the mind is not a physical phenomena, according to Buddhism at least. So it has no spatial properties. It has no size. It has no location. Yeah, but that's we're talking sensory perception now. I'm talking mental consciousness. That's something different. What's, what's different? Because we only sense. We sense the concept, or we grasp, grasp on the. Concept, we have much more than senses. On the, on the senses. And so what? Yeah, but but our our sense of me is is conceptual. So we have we can have uh, a lot of conceptions. We can't have the conception of locating ourselves in a cave only with a sound. We, no, can't, no. we can't give a nature because we don't have any sense to relate the concept to. I think because the concept of me is related to... Some part of your body and mind. The body or some part of that I can think or things like that. Yeah, so your sense, that's right. So, so you can't, can't have the concept Feeling like a bat, for example, because they don't know... Yeah, but a bat, or regardless of any animal, only has a sense of, of self on the basis of body and mind. How that body and mind functions is a little bit different. Okay, the sense faculties are different, and some animals can't see colours, and we can see colours. But in all of those cases, they have a concept or a sense of me based on body and mind. But anyway, that's still coming. So maybe we, we're jumping ahead here. So I think my, from my own experience as a mother, like, um, I remember, in the, especially in the beginning, uh, every time my child was crying, I was really hurt. I was really feeling pain in my body, in my stomach. So I think this example that your your uh, knee can, can be, be uh, included more uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> more inclusive than the body yeah, of course yeah yeah sure absolutely absolutely it can be very big or very small okay anyway let's move on um so when we grasp onto this independent me then we are completely out of sync with reality because we're fighting against reality, because there's only a dependent me, but we see ourselves as independent to the world, then, of course, we're struggling and fighting against reality. We're out of sync with reality, and that's why we suffer and, and 
and people around us suffer because of that. Now, very often in our behaviour, there is this strong self-grasping. There's often this strong sense of me going there, me doing this, me saying that. And that me, me, me is usually with this grasping onto independent me. So very often we are very much strongly out of sync with reality because we're often so self-focused. Self-grasping is very strong. But sometimes in our behavior, this self-grasping is not as strong. Sometimes we're more focused on the activity rather than the me doing the activity. And that often happens when we have good focus. You know, If we're absorbed in uh, watching a good program on TV, we're absorbed in reading a good book, we're absorbed in fixing a problem at work. In all of those occasions, there's more focus on the activity than the agent. So in those cases, self-grasping is a little bit less. And so we notice from our own experience, in those occasions, things seem to go quite well, and time seems to move quite quickly. Why? Because we're not fighting against reality so much, because our self-grasping is not quite as strong as normal. So that's why things seem to flow a lot better and easier. And this is very much emphasized in people who've developed a high level of focus in their activity, you know, like professional athletes, professional musicians, who spent thousands of hours of training in their activity and have developed a high level of focus in, their, in that activity. And then sometimes when they're in that activity, they often report that they're in the flow state, they're in the zone. Mm -hmm. So what's happening there, of course, is due to their high level of focus, then the grasping is very much reduced. So much so that sometimes they say, well, there was just the music playing. There was no sense of me. There was just the sporting activity happening. No sense of me. Not only that, but often in that situation, they report peak performance, optimum performance. Why? Because they're not fighting against reality. They're more in harmony with reality due to the reduced, very much reduced self-grasping. But that's only due to the power of concentration. Here in the Vipassana practice, we're talking about much more than that. We're talking about eliminating self-grasping by realizing there's no independent me. So if we can realize there's uh, no independent me through this emptiness practice, then self-grasping we can eliminate. We can then be completely in sync with reality. And if we're like that, the Buddha's assertion is that we have no mental afflictions or suffering if we achieve that state. And thereby, if we realize this emptiness, particularly focused on ourself, we'll realize there's no boundary here. There's no me and them, separate, independent. And so when we realize emptiness directly, it's said that when we come out of that experience, we've realized there's no boundary. There's no, not a single boundary in the entire universe, in fact. And it's said that when we come out of that, we'll have boundless love and compassion for everyone else because we'll realize directly through that emptiness experience there's no separation, there's no me and them, independent them. So therefore, um, that's a sign that our emptiness meditation is going well, is that if we come out of it and we have a sense of being much more connected with others and loving kindness and compassion becomes stronger. That's a, a good sign that our emptiness practice is going in the right direction. Um, question. Um, why, <clears throat> I don't really understand why um, if we're self-grasping, we're out of sync with reality. We stand with reality. Well, is this big? <laughs> is it big? No, well, That's the same as self-grasping. Yeah, but why is it out of sync with reality? Like, why are we fighting because reality, because big can only exist relative to small, that's reality. Me can only exist relative to not me, that's reality. So when we don't, when we, we, when we grasp onto something opposite to that, we are completely out of sync with the way things exist. The way things exist is that you can only have experiencer relative to experienced. You can only have subject relative to object. That's the reality. We're, we're, we're not seeing reality correctly 
And therefore, we're basing our behaviour on the fact or believing there's an independent me here. That's completely out of sync with the way things are. Developmental stage uh, around the age of five, four, five, where children are very preoccupied with this sort of thing. Preoccupied with with what's me, what isn't me. Uh huh. Like even you know, my grandson was five. I guess they must have had something about sexual harassment that they did in kindergarten. He says to me, you know, people kiss me without my permission. And then he decided he doesn't want that. He's not going to allow anybody to kiss him. He says it's okay to hug him. And this is a whole preoccupation with, you know, what's me, how much control I have over it. And it, it's also expressed in food. All of a sudden at this age, a lot of kids, they get really picky. They're very busy deciding what, you know, usually for that age, you give kids something to eat and they eat it. And then they reach the stage where they say, I can decide what I'm going to eat. <laughs> so it's this whole business of what's me, what isn't me, who's in control of it. So it seems when you look at a growing human being, it seems like this is a necessary stage of development. What's a necessary stage of development is to draw more healthy lines, to distinguish in a more healthy way, me versus not me. Yes, if we don't do that, we become completely dysfunctional. Well, so we need yeah. to be able to draw very healthy lines, and we have to do that. But the problem is, on top of that, we turn these lines, which are important and necessary, into boundaries. Then the problems begin. So yes, we have to have a healthy sense of me versus not me through drawing good lines. If we don't draw good lines, then mess, big mess. And we see that. But then the problem is, on top of that, we, we corrupt that, we pollute that by making that good line that we've drawn into a boundary. That's the, the problem. That's the problem. Well, that's the part I'm having a trouble with. You know, when is it? When is it a good line and when is it a boundary? Because it seems to me like this idea, you know, of interconnectedness. It's an idea that I can easily right. understand. Right. Exactly. So. Know? But what does it mean? You know, does it mean like, for instance, you know, how much control do you have over your body? Is it okay to let anybody kiss you that wants to? You know, like my grandson's, you know, thing. Um, or not, you know, like if it's if it's yours, then you have control over it. If it isn't, so th there's really, I mean, as an idea, yeah, you know, interconnectedness. A butterfly flutters its wings in Brazil, and you have a storm and whatever. But when it really comes <coughs> down to um, how do you live it? Stay right. Out. Exactly. That's the point. Exactly the point is to live it. We need to get it out of in this intellectual understanding that. The butterfly, wings of a butterfly, creates an earthquake in China. As long as that's an idea, we can't live it. We can't live it because it's just an idea. Because our, our behavior is driven by our habits. And our habits are not now reflecting that a, the butterfly wings fluttering in the Amazon creates an earthquake in China. That's not. It's In fact, our habits is exactly opposite to that. Our habit says there's no interconnectedness. So our habits is opposite to our intellectual understanding. It's as if you have to create a porous line, a porous kind of line. Porous uh, this, line. This, uh, something that, um, that can be, that things, that things can move through. Mm. You know, like for instance, I can see I've observed in my life. Porous that, line. Well, <laughs> I mean, from no, but I've observed that when you hang around a certain place, Right. You're very affected by this place you're around. You know, if you're in a war zone, sure, you know, sure, you're sure. Or, or whatever, if you're in a sure, hospital, sure. or if you're at a party, or whatever. Sure. But also, like, this is a little bit that kind of thing of, you know, like the cell is defined, but its nature changes. It's exactly. Influenced by its environment. Exactly. And that's the point is that. This is the line drawing, and we draw lines according to meaning, to the place. So these lines are, I wouldn't use the word porous, but I'd say flexible. Porous sounds, I don't know. Anyway, flexible. So we need to do this creative line drawing according to the situation. But the problem is, when we turn that line into a boundary, then it becomes very solid and fixed. 
And then when the situation changes, then that boundary, then there's conflict. But that boundary to begin with is the problem. So if we can keep our line drawing at the level of line drawing, then we can be flexible and adaptive and work with changing conditions. But when those lines become boundaries, then we're in trouble in any situation. Any situation. Anyway, we've, uh, we need a morning tea break. So let's go for a morning tea break, come back at uh, 11.15, um, and then we're going to start with a Vipassana meditation looking at me. Where's the me? <laughs>